Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to focus on the catabolic process of amino acid oxidation and also look into the production of urea, which is connected to amino acids. This small chapter is going to focus on how proteins get digested in animals, how we oxidize amino acids for energy, and then generally how urea is made and also excreted. So remember that we are focusing in this half of our course on the catabolism of molecules. So breakdown of large molecules into their smaller building blocks to use um, usually for energy or just in general metabolic processes in the body. So today, again, we're focusing on how we take proteins, very large proteins that we ingest and then break them down into their building blocks, which remember are called amino acids, and then utilize those amino acids in different ways. So one of those ways is, of course, to get fuel, to get energy. And about 90% of our energy as carnivores, as human and any carnivore, anything that is consuming meat, which has protein in it, can be met by the amino acids themselves. So only a small fraction of energy needs of the herbivores are met by amino acids. This kind of distinguishes them as, as organisms, right? Um, carnivoric animals are going to rely on protein from meat, whereas herbivores are going to rely on things like sugars um, and some lipids that they can ingest directly from plants. Plants don't use amino acids as a fuel source, but they can degrade amino acids to form other metabolites. Meaning that plants also have these pathways of breaking down and using amino acids to some extent. So even plants can get some energy or utilize amino acids. Okay, so let's talk about different pathways amino acids can go into, different circumstances. Um, there could be leftover amino acids and that's just from our normal turnover of proteins. So um, you're making a lot of hemoglobin, for example, and the hemoglobin is old and maybe starting to degrade. So your cells start to make new hemoglobin to replace it. Well, that old hemoglobin will then be broken down. It'll be lysed and regenerated into other proteins. This is just normal turnover. <clears throat> of course, we also can intake amino acids via dietary. Um, these could exceed the amount of the protein synthesis that our body needs if you intake enough dietary amino acids. Proteins in the body can be broken down to supply amino acids also, and this can happen in energy. So we can actually take the proteins that we're utilizing that don't need to be replaced. For example, muscles, our muscles are made up of, um, our muscle cells have large proteins in them. And these can be broken down in the need that we have to get energy from them. So in cases like starvation or diabetes, where you are low on blood sugar and your body is sourcing other materials to make energy, um, if you don't intake enough protein or have other sources of protein, the body will turn to its own structural protein to get energy. Okay, so in the case of dietary proteins, where you're actually ingesting proteins, you've just had a nice meal, maybe you had a nice steak or hamburger, and your, your 
body is going to break down that protein, right? Um, it's going to go through our normal digestion system. And similar to when we talked about lipids and how lipids get broken down in our digestion, there are special enzymes that help us break down big proteins in our digestive system. Um, these normally end in the, the ending function of SYN. So pepsin, trypsin, chymotrypsin, these are all types of enzymes, they're proteins themselves, <laughs> that then break down other proteins. Um, they all are very specialized and they help break down proteins at specific areas. Uh, so pepsin, for example, can cut proteins into peptides in the stomach, normally found in the stomach. Trypsin and chymotrypsin also can cut proteins into peptides um, either into large peptides or into smaller uh, peptides. And these are found in the small intestine. So we're kind of like going through as, as these chunks go through, they will encounter different uh, enzymatic degradation proteins, which help cut them down further. There's also aminopeptidase and carboxypeptidase A and B. And these help now degrade even smaller those peptides into amino acids and this occurs in the small intestine. So again, as you go through these different specialized enzymes are going to cut the protein into smaller and smaller chunks until essentially you get down to this amino peptidase and carboxypeptidase, which will cut it down into um, small amino acids. Now, there's also something special about these peptidases, and it is where they cut. Um, this is known, we know exactly where these uh, enzymes will start to degrade a peptide or a protein, and they've actually been utilized for, um, for science as well. So for example, Amino peptidase always will remove amino acids from the N terminal of a peptide. So here you can see amino peptidase. Here's the N terminal. Remember, that's the free amino portion of a peptide with that, it's going to have that plus charge on it. So amino peptidase always will cut right at the end of a peptide. It sees that free amino group or the free amino NH3, and it will cut that particular end off. Similarly, carboxypeptidase will look for the free carboxy end of a peptide or a protein, and it always cuts when it finds that carboxy end. It'll cut there. You can see this is why carboxypeptidase and aminopeptidase are so strong in how, how they cut down. They're found at the end of digestion because they'll just keep looking for those end portions and they'll keep cutting inward. Now, our other, uh, our other enzymes are going to cut at specific places and they are uh, less strategic, they're going to go for specific amino acids. Pepsin, for example, only ever cuts um, in linkages involving aromatic amino acids. So tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine. Um, it also targets methionine and leucine. These are not aromatic, but it will also cut between these. So again, pepsin generally is going to cut uh, the peptide linkage between an aromatic and another previous. So you can see here is an aromatic group and pepsin is cutting that peptide linkage. Notice to what side of the aromatic group it is cutting it. Chymotrypsin also attacked in a preferential area. It's going to attack peptide bonds in involving carboxyl groups of aromatic amino acids, 
So phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. Um, you can see it as well is cutting right here. Notice on the carboxyl side of the aromatic group. Trypsin is going to attack peptide bonds involving the carboxyl group of groups of basic amino acids. So lysine and arginine. You can see right here, we have a nice basic amino acid and it is cutting the carboxyl group, carboxyl side of that peptide bond. Here's the carboxyl and the peptide bond it cuts is following that carboxyl group. So that's where trypsin will cut. Again, trypsin is gonna cut basic amino acids on the carboxyl side, chymotrypsin or pepsin. Remember pepsin can do either. Will cut the carboxyl end of this peptide bond. And here we're showing pepsin again. Pepsin in this case is um, cutting on a uh, methionine. So it's cutting the methionine group here. Remember, pepsin can do methionine, leucine, and it also can do aromatic. As along with chymotrypsin, which only does aromatic. So again, these are very specialized. And the reason that uh, this is important is because, again, in science, sometimes we will specifically use one of these enzymes to help us break down a protein. And if we want to target a specific linkage, for example, then you would want to pick the appropriate enzyme to target that particular linkage in the protein. So this is the basics of breaking down amino acids as far as dietary. Uh, we're going to, they're going to systematically go through the digestive system and encounter these different enzymes, which will break them down into small amino acids. So once we have amino acids, all the types of proteins are then treated in the same way based on what our energy needs are. They can be recycled into new proteins as stated. So they might just be shuttled off to um, areas within the cell to then rebuild up. So these are gonna be ribosomes and they're just gonna rebuild proteins. Or in the case of needing energy, amino acids can be oxidized to get energy. But to do this, they have to ha be processed. There needs to be the removal of the amino group, which happens in the re urea cycle. And then entry into central metabolism, they can go into glycolysis or the citric acid cycle. So again, this is the case in which we are going to break down amino acids for energy. <clears throat> so we've taken in proteins, they've been broken down into amino acids. And you can see the very, very, very basics of this is you're going to need to take the amino acid and pull off the amino portion of it. That amino portion is not going to be utilized. It doesn't get used for energy. We're just using carbon for energy. So we wanna pull off the amino portion, take what's left over, the carbon skeleton. And depending on what that carbon skeleton is, it can most likely enter the citric acid cycle. It can then be broken down, made into CO2, um, NADH, FADH, GTP, and eventually all of those can make ATP, right? Also, if you needed instead to make glucose, so if your blood sugar is low and you intake protein, that amino acid could then be turned into its carbon skeleton, 
that carbon skeleton can enter the citric acid cycle still to help make more oxaloacetate, which remember can be used for gluconeogenesis. Oxaloacetate is one of those products that is an in-between for the citric acid cycle. It's very important for citric acid cycle, but it also is one of the precursors to help in building glucose. So you can also go through this pathway to help build glucose if that is what your energetic needs demand. But what happens to that amino group? We still have to take care of it. Free ammonium is not good for our system. So this is going to enter the urea cycle and we're gonna talk about that cycle. So to be clear, there are different forms of nitrogen that animals and organisms utilize um, through their metabolism. There's free ammonia. This is what it looks like, NH4 plus as an ammonium ion. Uh, some animals do have free ammonia in their body. Uh, these are normally aquatic vertebrates like bony fish or certain larvae of amphibia. So they can excrete just straight ammonia. Um, they usually excrete it <laughs> into the water. Um, <clears throat> now, what we're familiar with as far as most terrestrial vertebrates and also sharks is urea. So you can see this is actually a compound of nitrogen with a carbonyl group. Uh, urea is a, a compound of ammonia to help us for anim terrestrial animals and sharks safely remove ammonia in a way that is not going to be harmful to our other systems. And there's also uric acid. This is another form that animals will use to kind of bind up that ammonia and remove it from their bodies. These are animals like birds and reptiles. Uh, and this actually can crystallize slightly. So you'll, you will see it um, in a more crystalline form when it is excreted. <laughs> Now I want you to notice that in the forms of urea and both uric acid, that these are highly oxidized compounds. So the organism is essentially discarding carbon after getting all of that energy from it, completely oxidizing it of its energy for fuel. It is then compounded with ammonia to then be excreted. Okay, so how do we remove that amino group? Remember that for us as terrestrial organisms, free ammonia is toxic. So we can't just rip it off and get rid of it. <laughs> it needs to be captured and it's captured through a series of processes. And again, eventually is formed into um, urea or in some animals, uric acid which then can be safely excreted. Ammonia first is going to be captured through a series of what are called transaminations. This is a type of reaction which is just moving the ammonia around. It shuffles that ammonia group from compound to compound. You can see this normally is going to occur in the liver where we have our transamination reactions. And in fact, transamination reactions are often measured as a uh, process of liver health. So we can, we can measure how well your liver is doing based on if there is kind of a buildup uh, or a slowdown of these reactions. You don't want to have ammonia building up in your liver. <clears throat> Again, transamination allows for the transfer of that amine to some other metabolite. Um, and it's also going to generate. So again, we're, we're shuffling here. I'll show you an example. You have an amino acid coming in. Here's an ingested amino acid. 
we want to finish breaking it down, right? We want it to go into the citric acid cycle and be further broken down, but we need to get rid of that ammonia first. Well, transaminations are going to take specifically alpha ketoglutarate. Remember this, this is a molecule from the citric acid cycle, you've seen it before. It's going to take alpha ketoglutarate and shuffle that amine group to the glutamate. You can see alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutamate by taking that amine group. So alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutarate. During this process, the amino acid loses its amine group and becomes what we just call as a keto acid. Keto acid is a general term to describe the carbon skeleton that is left over after we remove the amino group from an amino acid. That keto, keto acid can go now into the citric acid cycle. It can also be converted through other processes um, to make pyruvate potentially or other things. But that keto acid now is the carbon skeleton that can be utilized off in other parts. But we still have to deal with this glutamate, right? We made glutamate, we transferred our um, amino group to it and it's our amino group is still around. We made glutamate. What do we do with glutamate now? Well, glutamate can go down into further processes of the urea cycle to get rid of that amino group. Um, it also can be transferred between glutamine and glutamate. And we'll talk about those more. Okay, so again, we're gonna focus on ammonia capture here. I just gave a, an overview of what's going on, but we're gonna get into the details of how we get rid of that ammonia and all of the processes involved in it. Again, the first step here is always going to be transamination. This is catalyzed by a special type of enzyme called an aminotransferase. Aminotransferases are extremely important uh, and they actually do act in lots of areas within the body, um, but most specifically in the liver where they're going to be helping to uh, take off those amino groups from amino acids. These enzymes, the enzymes that are amino transferases use a cofactor called pyridoxal phosphate. Uh, this is a, you can find it actually as a nutritional supplement um, it's made from a vitamin and it is part of, it's actually bound into the enzyme itself. Again, the amino transferases are going to typically take alpha ketoglutarate as their acceptor to accept the amino group off of whatever amino acid has come in and then make glutamate. So alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutamate through this process of amino transferase. And at the same time, we take our incoming um, amino acid and remove it, its amino group to make a keto acid. Now there is a potential for that glutamate to have a second transfer. So we can actually stick on another amino acid or excuse me, amino group onto that glutamate and make what is called glutamine. Uh, glutamate and glutamine are both essentially temporary storages of nitrogen um, that can then shuttle off to the urea cycle. So glutamine acts as this just like temporary reservoir uh, and it can donate amino groups when is needed for amino acid biosynthesis as well, right? So if we ever need to build amino acids, then glutamine is kind of the reservoir to say, well, I can get rid of this amino group if needed, or if you need it to help build amino acids, then I have that nitrogen. So again, here's what that transamination looks like. 
we're going to use an amino transferase enzyme, which uses pyridoxal phosphate or PLP. You will see it written as well. Here's our incoming amino acid and it becomes a keto acid. Now there are different amino transferases for different amino acids. For example, there's alanine amino transferase. There is aspartate amino transferase. Um, and each of these results in a different keto acid, right? Because the amino acid structure is different. The keto acid structure of the original amino acid will be different as well. Some amino transferases are important for generation of things like neurotransmitters because the neurotransmitter is the keto acid form of whatever e amino acid. So for example, tryptophan, tryptophan is very important in generating neurotransmitters through this process. Again, alpha ketoglutarate is kind of our opposite here. It's going to take on that amino group and form glutamate. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about pyridoxal phosphates uh, because it is very important to this process. Again, it is derived from a vitamin that is vitamin B5. And what it is doing is temporarily holding on to that amino group within the enzyme. So it is doing the work of that temporary binding of the amino group, which will then transfer onto our alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. This process forms uh, this version of pyridoxal phosphate, which is called pyridoxamine phosphate. This is when it is bound to that amino group. And you can see more closely kind of what's happening here. Here is, <clears throat> excuse me, our uh, pyridoxal phosphate and <clears throat> sorry, uh, are the enzyme itself holding on to this lysine with an amine group. It's going to accept electrons from this lysine and it actually binds on to the enzyme forming what is called a shift face. This is an internal aldamine, is what it's called. Um, and it is what is allowing for the transfer of that amino group. This in particular, this shift base structure is very important. Notice it's, it's a very interesting um, linkage where you have a nitrogen that is double bound to a carbon. And it's also forming another single bond and it has a hydrogen on it. So it is a nitrogen with four bonds, right? which gives it that positive charge. Uh, this, this shift base structure is again, pretty unique for this particular reaction. And it is what uh, allows us to monitor the reaction completion of an amino transferase. And if you're interested, you can see here is the actual pyridoxal phosphate held in place by that shift base to a lysine. So it will bond again via this shift base directly onto the amino transferase enzyme um, to help with the processing of the amino group. So you can see this is the lysine portion right here where it is directly bound into the amino transferase. As I stated, PLP helps catalyze a bunch of different reactions. There are lots of different amino transferases that use PLP. Um, some examples are aspartate transferase, which helps convert aspartate and alpha-ketoglutarate 
to oxaloacetate and glutamate. So remember, alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutamate once it takes on the amino group. In this case, you can see that aspartate, once it loses its amino group, becomes oxaloacetate, which we are familiar with is a very important um, keto acid for the citric acid cycle and for our gluteogenesis. Now, there's also another enzyme called alanine transferase. This is going to specifically catalyze the transfer of alanine to alpha ketoglutarate. And its products, as you can see, are pyruvate and glutamate. Again, alpha ketoglutarate, once it takes on that amino group, becomes glutamate. And we can see that alanine, when it has its amino group removed, becomes the very important molecule pyruvate. So these, this interconversion, as you can see, is a very important balance. It, it's reversible and it helps you balance between a lot of our keto acids that are utilized in the uh, energy metabolism, like pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and amino acids, right? You can go back and forth between pyruvate and alanine or oxaloacetate and aspartate. And this is an important balance um, depending on what the energy demands are of our body. Do we need to build up proteins or do we need to break down proteins and help get energy? I picked these two, the uh, aspartate transferase and alanine transferase because they are clinical biomarkers. They act in the liver as most of these transferases do uh, and they are biomarkers for liver health. Commonly, your AST, ALT levels will be measured if there is suspect of liver damage. So I want to spend a moment talking about the glucose alanine cycle. We just saw the importance of alanine and, again, its ability to be converted into pyruvate pyruvate being one of the more important molecules with numerous fates that can go into different energy cycles. So uh, there is a cycle between muscles and liver that is called the glucose alanine cycle. Um, I believe this is sometimes <clears throat> referred to as the Cori cycle. In the case where you have the vigorous working of muscles, so you've taken a lot of glucose and broken it down in glycolysis to make pyruvate, right? We've talked about this already. You're vigorously working your muscles um, and you need to, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to regenerate or you're, you're taking that pyruvate, you're breaking it down, you're, you're constantly going through just glycolysis, right, fast. This is in a case where you're probably in an anaerobic environment because you're low on oxygen because you're working your muscles so hard. Uh, in this case, you need to start to regenerate glucose to get more energy to potentially shuttle to the muscles. <clears throat> One way to transfer that pyruvate to the liver to then be used for glucose is to first transform it into alanine. So alanine is just going to serve as a carrier of ammonia out of the muscles. This is so we do not, um, we don't have an excess of ammonia around that alanine can then be transferred to the liver where it can be reconverted into pyruvate, which can be converted into glucose via gluconeogenesis and shuttled back to the muscle. <clears throat> so again, this is in a case where you're really, really, really working. Um, you're also needing to break down proteins into amino acids to use them potentially for energy. In this case, you have a lot of ammonia that is starting to build up um, in the form of glutamate because your 
you're getting a lot of amino acids and breaking them down. So you're breaking down glucose and you're breaking down amino acids to potentially use for your muscle energy. You have a lot of glutamate around. Here you can actually take the pyruvate you've broken down and make it out to alanine temporarily, shuttle all of that out. Alanine carries the, the ammonia into the liver in which it then is retransformed into pyruvate, which can be used to make glucose and that alanine amino transferase in the liver is going to reshuttle off that ammonia into glutamate where it can then go into the urea cycle. Again, this back and forth, like why are we taking it off glutamate, putting it on alanine, then going to the liver, putting it back on to glutamate. This is just to get it from the muscle to the liver because the urea cycle um, and the con continuous removal of that amino group is not going to be able to occur in the muscles. We do not have the um, enzymes to make urea to the extent that we need to in the muscles, and it needs to first be moved to the liver where it can then be transferred to the urea cycle. <clears throat> Another place where we see the use of amino transferases, and this is in a different, different manner, um, is again in other amino acids such as phenylalanine. Uh, one disease that can occur is when you have the lacking of transform of phenylalanine to phenylpyruvate. So this particular amino acid, if it is um, impaired, or if you are born without that, this is called phenylketonuria, PKU, will lead to the accumulation of this um, phenylpyruvate in the, in the tissue, um, or also phenylalanine. You actually can get both because they're not able to transform back and forth into each other to balance each other out. Uh, this can impair neurological development. It can lead to intellectual deficits. And the only way to kind of control this in people who have PKU is just by limiting the amount of phenylalanine that they ingest uh, because they can't really break it down and, and utilize that phenylalanine properly. <clears throat> Again, another uh, specific type of amino transferase and its importance is in the formation of GABA. GABA is a very important uh, neurotransmitter for our brain, and it is formed via an amino transferase from amino acid oxidation. So you can see uh, GABA is actually in balance with succinate semialdehyde, which is another, um, another type of metabolite, and pyruvate and alanine. So here notice that we're not using alpha-ketoglutarate and glutarate, but instead um, alanine can transform into pyruvate. Remember that's a normal if it removes its amino group. So alanine will remove its amino group off onto succinate semialdehyde, which will then transform into GABA. Similarly, GABA can, can be made through another amino transferase that uses glycine. Glycine can take off its amino, its amino group and it makes glycoxylate. And again, it will take off its amino group onto succinate semialdehyde which becomes then GABA. So GABA, its keto acid form is the succinate semialdehyde, and it can be formed through another special amino transferase, which uses other amino acids such as alanine, 
or glycine and transfers the amino group to make GABA. <clears throat> now, because we know about this amino transferase and its importance in the formation of GABA via um, succinate semialdehyde and other amino acids, there are various types of drugs that can act um, on this particular amino transferase. So for example, um, this Vigabitrin is a medication used to treat epilepsy and it is working by inhibiting the breakdown of GABA. So one way it does this is by targeting that amino transferase. How does it target the amino transferase? Well, it actually targets the pyridoxal phosphate. This particular molecule looks like pyridoxal phosphate. It will bind to that amino transferase and stop it from being able to do this particular transformation. There is a similar, um, similar molecule, gabaculin, which is actually a naturally occurring neurotoxin. This was first isolated from bacteria and it similarly acts as a potent but irreversible <laughs> GABA transaminase inhibitor. Again, similarly by mimicking structure. It can bind into this amino transferase blocking completely the ability to make GABA from amino acids. Um, and then ultimately because of this leading to toxicity and death, because of the inability to produce this very important neurotransmitter. Okay, so we talked about the transfer of ammonia, right? We talked about amino transferases, all of their different functions in different areas, but generally this idea of being able to transfer ammonia from <clears throat> amino acids onto other ammonia carriers and, <clears throat> excuse me. And now let's talk about how we then take that ammonia and remove it. Now, as I went into one of the main molecules that is produced in order to act as an ammonia carrier from those amino transferases is glutamate, right? All of our, almost all of our amino transferases are taking uh, our ammonia off of an amino acid and moving it on to an alpha ketoglutarate forming glutamate. So now what do we do with our glutamate? Well, excess glutamate or glutamine can be processed in the intestines, the kidneys, and the liver by a enzyme called glutamine synthase. So you can see here is a glutamate and we're going to use energy to then through this process, synthesize glutamine at this step. So you can see glutamate goes through glutamine synthase using an ATP. It makes glutamyl phosphate through this process. So we've actually just phosphorylated a glutamate. The glutamine, glutamyl phosphate then goes through glutamine synthase again. So I'm going to point out that this is the same enzyme. It can intake both of these. And in its second go through, it is going to now put on another ammonia group and remove that phosphate. So now we have a compound with not one, but two ammonium groups that have been added onto it. This is glutamine. As I said, glutamine can ultimately act as a reservoir for ammonia. At this point, you can stop. Glutamine can safely, um, safely carry that ammonia. Uh, and in the case that ammonia is needed, glutamine can then be transformed um, to use for amino acid building. But 
if you have too much glutamine, you have too much ammonia, you want to get rid of that ammonia. So glutamine is then going to enter normally uh, one of these areas, the kidney, the liver, the intestines, where it can then be broken down by glutaminase. So glutaminase, right? Complete breakdown of glutamine. We've synthesized glutamine from glutamate, and now we are going to remove its ammonia. So notice this process is going to take the ammonia off and convert it into urea. And through it, we regenerate glutamate. So glutamate is acting as a character that can temporarily hold on to an amino group we have to specifically take it into glutamine in this case to then remove that ammonia and um, process it into urea. Now there's also an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase. This is a way, a means to move like remove the ammonia from the glutamate. Um, this is an oxidative deamination that occurs in the mitochondria and it has to use an NAD or an NADP as an electron acceptor. So again, it can use either of them, NAD or NADP, and it's going to generate the requisite either NADH or NADPH. Uh, and you can see this is going to take our glutamate dehydrogenase, or excuse me, take our glutamate, go through this glutamate dehydrogenase, uh, and it can be regulated into this temporary stage, which then can be made into alpha ketoglutarate. This is through a, a kind of temporary bypass where our ammonia is removed into the urea cycle for excretion. This process is normally used by plants and microorganisms. Um, and there is a mammalian enzyme that is that uses this process, but it's regulated by GTP and ATP, ADP, excuse me. So again, this is another way that we can take the ammonia directly off of glutamate through glutamate dehydrogenase. So I wanna be clear, two ways to get ammonia into the urea cycle. Take your glutamate, make it into glutamine and remove one ammonia into the urea cycle or take your glutamate, go through glutamate dehydrogenase form alpha ketoglutarate and you're removing that ammonia group into the urea cycle. Okay, so let's talk reactions of the urea cycle. You can see that this is where we are actually going to be taking that glutamate. I've kind of said it in a way that is very general. We're removing the ammonia to the urea cycle. But we're going to be taking that glutamate <clears throat> and converting it through this process of steps into first acetylglutamate using an acetyl CoA and then carbamyl phosphate. This can then enter our urea cycle. Here is the actual urea cycle. Similar to our citric acid cycle, we have a con uh, condensation step in which we are condensing molecules, um, starting with carbamyl phosphate, which enters to form citrulline and goes through the cycle. You can see there is a condensation step in which we take citrulline and condense it with aspartate to form arginyl succinate. This is then already broken 
into fumarate and arginine, which then will form urea and orthanine, which orthanine can go back into the cycle and recondense with carbamyl phosphate to again, get to citrulline. So this process is going to be much more complex than the citric acid cycle. There's a lot of stages in which you can kind of convert into other um, steps of molecules like fumarate. You can take an aspartate here. Um, but generally I want to point out that this cycle, one of the important parts of the cycle is that it occurs between the mitochondria and the cytosol. This, this particular point is very important. Notice that our first steps of the urea cycle are going to occur in the mitochondria. You can see that one of the first stages uses acetyl-CoA. That's gonna be found in the mitochondria. Um, Again, it can come from the citric acid cycle or it can come from lipids that are being broken down. This is generally going to be found in the mitochondria where we condense it with glutamate to then lead to carbamyl phosphate and go into the cycle. Notice that only citrulline and orthanine are the only two molecules that are actually part of the cycle and within the mitochondria. The rest of the cycle occurs in the cytosol. Um, so these molecules, uh, arginosexinate, uh, this arginine, the urea itself and the orthanine <clears throat> cannot directly pass into the mitochondria. They have to be converted into orthanine uh, or uh, citrulline to then go through into the mitochondria. This, this processing is important, the separation of the urea cycle between the two, um, because it is also balanced by another cycle. So to communicate between the citric acid cycle, which occurs inside the mitochondria, and the urea cycle, which mostly occurs in the cytosol with just a small portion happening in the mitochondria, uh, we need to be able to kind of convert and transform these potential products to communicate between the two cycles. So for example, one of the steps of the urea cycle generates a compound called arginosexinate. And arginosexinate can be turned into fumarate. Fumarate, of course, is one of the molecules in the citric acid cycle, and it could be um, brought back into the citric acid cycle. However, fumarate cannot directly pass back into the mitochondrial matrix and instead has to be transformed into malate, which can pass into the mitochondrial matrix. This is part of a shuttle we've already talked about, the malate aspartate shuttle. Malate and aspartate are two molecules that can move between the mitochondrial matrix and the cytosol. And as you saw here, Aspartate can be converted into our genosexinate. So aspartate is one of those molecules that can move. It can be converted into our genosexinate and we can use our genosexinate to then generate fumarate, which again can be generated, can formed into malate, which can move back in. So this is a way, this, this side shuttle is kind of a way to balance that urea cycle. Again, aspartate and malate, there's already a, a small shuttle that converts them between each other with the intermediate being oxaloacetate or aspartate can be converted into arginosexinate our genosexinate can also be converted into fumarate, 
fumarate can then be converted into malate. So this whole process on top here is called the aspartate or genosuccinate shunt of the citric acid cycle. Again, this is a way to connect the cycles through this arginosuccinate, connecting the urea cycle and ultimately the citric acid cycle together. Okay, so that's it for the focus on the urea cycle. I want you to understand generally how the cycles are taking place, how it's connected to the citric acid cycle, um, and this kind of breaking apart of parts of the urea cycle into the uh, mitochondria versus the cytosol. So let's talk a little bit further about amino acids and their use in the body. Now there are some amino acids that are considered essential, not essential and conditionally essential. This is defined by essential amino acids, which are obtained as dietary protein, meaning they are essential to intake. We have to get them from our diets. Non-essential amino acids are ones that are easily made from metabolites. These are ones that we can form on our own from other molecules. So for example, we just talked about how um, alanine uh, can be uh, transformed into pyruvate so, and vice versa. So pyruvate, for example, can be used to make alanine. Alanine thus is a non-essential amino acid. We have a very easy process of making alanine from other metabolites. <clears throat> of course, a consumption of foods is what's going to supply our essential amino acids, which are the ones that are going to be needed to uh, be made from dietary protein and cannot be made from other sources. Here's that table of ones that are essential, non-essential, and conditionally essential. Um, conditionally essential, just meaning that they're required to some degree in young or growing animals or during illness, meaning that um, generally we have the mechanisms to make them, but we normally need to intake at least partially uh, some dietary protein to get levels of these particular amino acids. Again, usually in times of youth when we're growing or during illness. So vulnerable times, we might need to intake to supplement these amino acids. You can see in the non-essential, these are ones some of the, the ones you've already seen that we focused on, alanine. We don't need, this is, we don't need to uh, intake it because we can make it from pyruvate. Uh, you've seen glutamate, aspartate also, aspartate can be made. Serine, asparagine, these are all ones that can be made from other metabolites, usually through an aminotransferase that we do not need to directly consume. The list, however, of essential amino acids is much longer. These are ones that need to come from dietary sources such as histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. Now, the areas that these amino acids can uh, go into as far as metabolism are often categorized as being ketogenic or glucogenic. And that means that amino acids that can be converted into ketone bodies for energy are called ketogenic. <clears throat> 
Amino acids that can be in some way converted into glucose are called glucogenic amino acids. And let me point out that some amino acids are both. They have the ability to be shuttled into a pathway where they can be made into ketone bodies and another pathway where they can be shuttled into making glucose. Here's kind of a summary of that. And you can see it is color coded in which we can see where amino acids can directly go into some portion of our energy metabolism uh, and whether or not that makes them glucogenic or ketogenic. So for example, amino acids that can be converted into some step of the citric acid cycle. So alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl CoA, fumarate, oxaloacetate. This generally makes them a glucogenic molecule because citric acid cycle in general can be at some point made into oxaloacetate, which we know can be used to make glucose. Also, any of them that can be converted to some extent into pyruvate. Pyruvate also can be used in gluconeogenesis to make glucose. Now, some amino acid skeletons can only be converted into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA cannot be directly linked to the formation of glucose, right? Acetyl-CoA is not used in gluconeogenesis, but acetyl-CoA can be used to make ketone bodies, which also can be used for energy sources. Another pathway of degradation of these amino acids that we can look into is tryptophan degradation. Tryptophan um, has a pretty special degradation pathway because it is involved in things like neurotransmitters. So tryptophan can be converted into serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. Um, it also can be in plants converted into indole acetate, which is a growth factor for plants. In um, most organisms, tryptophan also is the precursor for nicotinate, which, or niacin is, it's also called, which is the direct precursor of our molecules NAD and NADP. So here's another pathway in which amino acids can be used in metabolism that isn't directly related to this energy formation, as we just saw with the catabolism into glucogenic or ketogenic, they also can be used in other pathways, for example, to make NAD, which is very important um, in lots of steps of uh, all of our metabolism in the body. Glycine is another amino acid uh, that has some special pathways. So it can, go through these pathways where we see um, glycine cleavage. So this is a major pathway in mammals in which you can separate the glycine, the three atoms of the glycine to release CO2 and ammonia. Um, and also, it can be utilized through this pathway called amino oxidase. This is a minor pathway, but I bring this one up in particular because it ultimately is oxidized into something called oxalate. This happens in the kidneys and it can be a major component of kidney stones. Now, generally this is a minor pathway to deal with degrading glycine, but in the case that you have too much use of the amino oxidase in your kidneys and too much buildup of oxal oxalate, you can then form kidney stones. 
So again, glycine can go through a couple different pathways to degrade, but I wanted to bring this one up, the amino oxidase pathway, because it is what eventually forms kidney stones. Another special type of breakdown is the breakdown of branched chain amino acids. So these are the amino acids valine, isoleucine, and leucine. Um, this does not occur in the liver. And they, all three of these branch chain can be oxidized for fuel. Uh, also in muscle, adipose tissue, the kidneys, and the brain, this can be used for fuel in general. You can see they actually have a specialized breakdown pathway in which they go through a series of conversions similar at some point to the oxidation of lipids. Um, these result in propanyl-CoA in some cases from valine or isoleucine. Isoleucine can also be converted into acetyl-CoA and leucine can be converted into acetyl-CoA or acetoacetate. So these are all ketogenic, right? Acetyl-CoA can go into the TCA cycle. Propanyl-CoA we talked about um, can eventually be converted into acetyl-CoA and acetoacetate is a ketone body, also can be converted into acetyl-CoA potentially, right? So these are all ketogenic pr uh, products which can be used for energy. Um, they can be used and broken down in the TCA cycle, but it's one way to take these branch chain amino acids and use them for fuel. Notice that this process also generates a lot of FADH um, and NADH during the conversion of the branch chain amino acids into acetyl-CoA. Now, one disease that is related to degradation of branch chain amino acids is called maple syrup urine disease. Uh, the conversion of branch chain amino acids into their ketogenic uh, products, so things like acetyl-CoA, any of the acyl-CoA derivatives, relies on a uh, combination of enzymes. One is branch chain amino transferase. So it does use an amino transferase. And then a branch chain alpha keto dehydrogenase complex. This is what I said. This complex is very similar to our um, complex found in both citric acid cycle and in breakdown beta oxidation of lipids right? This is a, another complex very similar to these ones we looked at previously. In some cases, there is a problem with this complex. And it can be defective in people, which causes something called maple syrup urine disease. And that's because they cannot adequately break down these branch chain amino acids and the branch chain amino acids come out in the urine um, as these keto acids. So we can convert them into keto acids. These particular keto acids um, tend to then make the urine quite um, dense and give it a particular smell, which is where it comes from. It gets the name maple syrup urine disease. But again, it is a problem in this particular complex, branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, which is very similar to pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, both of which we have talked about. Okay, another breakdown that's very specific is the breakdown of the amino acid methionine. Methionine is special because it uh, has to also deal with the transfer of sulfur 
in its breakdown. So not only do we need to get rid of that ammonia group, we have to think about movement of the sulfur group. So the methionine degradation involves transfer of the sulfur to serine, ultimately generating cysteine. So this is just kind of a transfer transformation process in which you're transferring the sulfur to various other molecules which utilize sulfur. The remaining methionine carbon skeleton also can then be used in branch chain amino acid pathways. You see that once methionine removes its um, removes its first of its sulfur groups here, it then is going to be transformed eventually through to propanyl CoA, which makes it ketogenic, right? It can enter into um, it can make acetyl-CoA and enter into the citric acid cycle that way to generate energy. But you can see it then is made into this other, uh, other acid here, ketoacid ketobutyrate, which can be formed via threonine. So threonine can come in and form ketobutyrate. Uh, we can also take methionine directly and form ketobutyrate, which then can be um, can be can be shuttled into the branch chain amino acid pathway, where it forms propanyl CoA. So I'm just going to go back a second and notice that. Um, through the breakdown of these branched chain amino acids, we get this keto acid, right? And one of the keto acids is ketobutyrate, alpha ketobutyrate, which can go through alpha keto acid dehydrogenase, that complex we just spoke about, to make propanyl CoA. You can see methionine has to transform off its sulfur group onto a serine to make a cysteine. So we spoke about these different processes of converting amino acids and some of the genetic disorders that actually affect amino acid catabolism, right? Uh, we talked about PKU, Phenol ketoria. This is where you have the lack to convert phenol alanine um, into tyrosine. Uh, and its particular defective enzyme is this phenol alanine hydroxylase. But you can see there are numerous types of genetic orders that affect different types of amino acid catabolism, and they result in a variety of different symptoms and effects, um, most of them developmental or ultimately um, in some way affecting neurological processes. One that is, I think, uh, not thought of as an amino acid disorder is albinism. So if you're an albino, right, you're lacking in melanin synthesis. This actually occurs from a defective enzyme taking tyrosine, tyrosine 3 monooxygenase or tyrosinase and converting it into melanin. Uh, and this is this particular enzyme, if it is defective, is what makes this albinism and you have lack of pigmentation. All right, so that's it for chapter 18. We talked about um, how amino acids from protein are an important energy source. We talked about the first steps of amino acid catabolism, which is that transfer of the amino group um, via amino transferases using PLP. We talked about how ammonia is um, then processed through the urea cycle. It's recaptured into a molecule called carbamyl phosphate and eventually passed into the urea cycle. And we talked about how that cycle talks to the citric acid cycle.
Then we focused on how amino acids are degraded into other molecules, such as pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, or oxaloacetate, right? We looked at ketogenic versus glucogenic, and we looked at other pathways that amino acids can be uh, utilized in to then result in other molecules. Lastly, we just took a second to focus on how genetic defects in these pathways we talked about in amino acid degradation can result in a number of human diseases.